In this video, we're going to learn about art in the Americas. As we can see in this image, the Americas are made up of North, Central, and South America. This is a huge region of land, so the artwork is going to reflect the different cultures, traditions, and materials available within each region. And for the sake of this video, we're going to start at the top and work our way down. Historically looking at North America, indigenous people lived in this region for thousands of years before the Europeans came. Some of the oldest found artifacts are tools and stone hearths, and they actually date back 20 to 30,000 years. Later we see tools carved from bone and spear points that are about 10,000 years old. The Hopal culture, which flourished in the 2nd century BCE until the 6th century CE, was located in modern-day Ohio. They produced many burial mounds with rich offerings found within elaborate log tombs. And they were followed by the Adena people who were also in Ohio. And they created the Great Serpent Mound, which we can see pictured here. It was designed by outlining rows of stones and then they piled in dirt in between these stones. The spiral portion is the tail of the snake and then the form serpentines up toward an open mouth that is holding a circular object. If it was stretched out, it would be longer than 1300 feet long. And while there's much debate about the specific meaning of this structure, it is worth noting that every summer solstice, the head and mouth are actually pointed toward the sunset. Next we have the indigenous people of the plains and they practiced the traditional art of buffalo hide paintings. In order to create these, the hide was stretched and dried in the sun before being painted on with organic pigments in a water-based solution. One popular genre of this style of painting was an exploit painting, wherein men traditionally depicted their deeds in battle. And as a result, they were often full of action with moving figures and a composition that does not rely on horizon lines. The best examples of which actually exist prior to European contact, although they are fairly rare. Once European settlers came in the 19th century, there were two main reasons for a decline in this art form. The first being that there was a literal decline of buffalo, so there was much less hide to paint on, so artists had to seek out new canvases. And second, the subject matter actually shifted to include battles with the U.S. military. For example, this painting by Howling Wolf was actually painted in a ledger book, which was one of the new canvases that became popular. And the event being depicted actually happened in 1864, during which military troops surrounded an encampment, opened fire, and murdered between 70 and 163 indigenous people. Howling Wolf actually signed this painting in the top right-hand corner by drawing a small wolf. And the text that was written on it was actually put there by a collector, not the artist. Howling Wolf's later work shifted from traditional exploit paintings to more of his personal experience with the U.S. government. Here we see a depiction of Fort Marion, which is where Howling Wolf was imprisoned. He and several hundred other warriors were there as part of an experiment, during which they cut their hair, which had spiritual and cultural meaning for them, put them in Western clothing, and gave them Christian names. Traditionally, Plains artists depict their subjects in profile only, and in Howling Wolf's later works, we actually see that he diverges from that, depicting his subjects from above or behind. This perspectival experimentation is just more evidence of Western influence. After three years, the experiment at Fort Marion ended, and Howling Wolf went back to a reservation in Oklahoma after which point he devoted himself to being an advocate for his people, looking for legal ways to improve their lives and make them easier, including food distribution. Moving on to the Navajo, who are located in Arizona. The Navajo have been known for more than two centuries for their weaving techniques and skills. Traditionally, the art form was female-dominated, though many men participate in weaving today. To create these works, artists would use a loom with warps spaced close together. This created a fabric that was so dense that it was nearly waterproof. The example that we see here is called a chief blanket, but not because it was reserved for high-ranking officials. Instead, it was because the quality was so high that only a few could afford to purchase and own one. Next, we have the Pueblo people, who were best known for their pottery. Each Pueblo has its own distinct style, and the example that we see here is from Acoma. 
These jars were made from local earthenware and they were shaped without using a pottery wheel. After that, they're then fired in an open fire and decorated with earthen powdered pigments. The symbolisms that we see throughout the mark making really don't have a fixed meaning. Instead, they reference the forces of nature and community life. Most Pueblos recognize the spirits of invisible life forces. However, these are actually known to the Zuni Pueblo and neighboring Hopi areas as Kachinas. In order to teach children of the tribes about these spirits, male members would dress up in masks and costumes to impersonate these spirits and give out Kachina figures or dolls. And they were intricately carved and painted with ornate designs using bright colors. The example that we see here would be created by Hopi and Zuni fathers and uncles to give to their children to teach about sacred traditions. This is the Hemis Kachina, which is associated with prayers for plentiful harvests. And this is reflected in the stepped pattern, which is meant to reference rain clouds, and the blue bars that are meant to reference stalks of corn. Located in Northern California, the Pomo people are known for their beautiful baskets. And while some of these baskets are created for aesthetic purposes, the weave is so tight that these forms can actually hold water. Stylistically, they utilize strong geometric designs and embellishments like feathers and shells, which we see in this example. They also ranged in size from just a fourth of an inch to four feet in diameter. And again, as we've seen in previous art forms, this was traditionally passed down to female members of the family. Along the coastline from Seattle to Alaska, we see various groups, including the Tlingit people, who are utilizing animal forms and elegant abstraction in both paintings and sculptures to reference their mythologies. These patterns of abstraction are utilized on house walls, boxes, blankets, and even dishes. A totem is an object, like an animal or a plant, that serves as an emblem of a family or clan. Many times, the symbol chosen represents original pre-human ancestors. And within the Native American language of the Upper Midwest, it actually means, quote, he is related to me. Looking at the Tlingit community house, which we see here, there are representations of bears, whales, beavers, ravens, and they're all abstracted in form. Additionally, in the center we see a stacked totem pole, which tracks a family or clan's history, even back to mythology, functioning similarly to a family crest. So previously we were just looking at different cultures within North America, and now we're going to move on to Mesoamerica, which consists of portions of Mexico and Central America. Civilizations throughout Mesoamerica influenced each other primarily through trade and conquest, so, while they are each very distinct in their own individual cultures, they do share many cultural forms because of this exchange. Some of these include pyramids, calendars, and important gods and myths. The earliest of these cultures was the Olmecs, and they were located on the Gulf Coast near what is now Veracruz. The Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan is one of the largest pyramids in the world located about 40 miles north of present-day Mexico City. There's an ancient Mexican belief that humanity itself emerged from a hole in the ground and that the cave this pyramid sits on top of could be the site of that origin. Additionally, the pyramid is aligned to face the sunset on August 12th, which is the beginning of the Mayan calendar. At one end of the long central avenue of Teotihuacan is the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. Many of the sculptural elements found throughout this temple affected cultures that came afterward. For instance, there were many relief sculptures depicting the head of the storm god that had goggle-like eyes and a scaly face, in addition to the feathered serpent. Teotihuacan itself was abandoned after burning in a mysterious fire in about 750 CE. However, both of the gods just mentioned are adopted by later cultures throughout ancient Mexico. Moving on to the Mayans, who were located in present-day Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. They were known for their development of written language, elaborate calendar, advanced mathematics, and large stone temple complexes. In Tikal, there were hundreds of temples that suggested that priests had great power. The one that we see in this example was created during the classical Maya period, 
from 300 to 900 CE. This structure is a pyramid topped by a temple and stands at 200 feet high. Priests used it for ceremonies, during which they emerged onto this high platform to perform dances as worshippers watched below. The example of Mayan sculpture that we see here is from a temple in Yashilan, which is located on the border of Mexico and Guatemala. The stone relief sculptures often had symbols along the side to help inform the narrative of the imagery. This example depicts Lord Shield Jaguar, who is holding a flaming torch, and his wife Lady Shope, who is performing a ritual during which she draws blood from her pierced tongue and then blots it with the pieces of paper in the basket in front of her. The artist depicts her in highly patterned clothing, which suggests advanced textile arts of the time period. That said, unfortunately, none of those exist today. Additionally, she is depicted with a headdress that appears to have the storm god on the crown of it identifiable with its goggle-like eyes. The text that was used to inform this image also gives the date, which was October 28, 709. The Toltec culture developed in central Mexico between the 9th and 13th centuries, creating a bridge between the decline of the Mayan and the rise of the Aztec civilization. In this time period, they created many innovations within architecture and massive carved figures. From the Mayan city Chichen Itza, we see the recumbent figure, or a reclining, leaning back figure, called the Chukmul. And this figure often had a bowl at the waist that was used for sacrificial offerings. While it was a Toltec form, it often occurred in both Mayan and Aztec art. In the 14th century, the Aztecs settled in modern-day Mexico City. At the time of the Spanish colonization, they were the most powerful city, and when the Spanish visited the Aztec capital, they found it cleaner and better governed than most European cities. Their art was an amalgamation of the many previous styles and themes that came beforehand. And beyond art, they also had highly developed forms of poetry and literature. The principal Aztec temple was a dual temple, and it was created to honor the storm and war gods. It was also the site where prisoners of war were made into human sacrifices. In doing this, the Aztecs believed they were honoring and recreating the feather serpent sacrifice in ancient times. This original sacrifice was said to have happened at Teotihuacan, which they regarded as a holy place. The feathered serpent, which the Aztecs referred to as Quetzalcoatl, was a reoccurring figure throughout their artwork. Commonly depicted in stone sculptures, it was found decorating temple walls and other ritualistic structures. The feathered serpent was the patron of priests who carried out the human sacrifices, and it also resembled the bringer of knowledge. It's composed of feathers that make up the body of the serpent, and a human head that emerges from its mouth. We can also see an ornate tongue with symbols, and a conch shell that adorns the bottom. Its components represent the earth, because that's where the serpent crawls, and the sky, which is where feathered birds fly. And in doing so, this figure unites both. Now we're going to move on to South America. Starting first in the Andes, we have the Incas. They flourished for several centuries prior to the Spanish invasion of 1532. And while the Spanish actually made note of how beautiful their artwork was, much of it was destroyed. Very few of the refined fabrics remain because they were either destroyed by age or just sheer neglect and most of their gold works were stolen and melted down or just destroyed by the Spanish. The Incas were best known for their skillful shaping and fitting of stones, and their masonry was characterized by mortarless joints and the rounded faces of granite blocks. Stoneworking was very culturally significant to them because the stone itself was important for their spirituality. There's even an Incan creation myth wherein two early ancestors emerged from the earth and immediately turned themselves into stone. As a result, some of their shrines are seen as living in themselves because they're made of these living stones, and they require offerings and care. The example of stoneworking that we see here is Machu Picchu, which was a royal retreat center in present-day Peru. At an 8,000 feet elevation, this architecture was created to appear as if it was part of the mountain and because of this, it was not detected by the Spanish. 
The carving and painting of caro cups were one of the few art forms to survive the Spanish conquest. A caro cup was used to hold beverages during ancient rituals, and these rituals were performed in secret for many generations. Looking at this example here, we see flat decorative patterns that derive from both pottery and textile designs. On a desert plateau overlooking the Nazca Valley, ancient Nazca people created a network of geometric lines and patterns in the dry land across a wide swath of coastal southwest Peru. Some of these designs contain straight lines, some stretching almost five miles long. And they also included geometric patterns like spirals, trapezoids, and triangles, in addition to abstracted images of various known and unknown animals and birds, such as the hummingbird that we see here. The lines that we see creating this form are very similar to ancient roads both in size and construction, and this image itself stretches about 310 feet long. Now we're going to look at some contemporary artists working in the Americas. As usual, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to all of these artists, and I strongly encourage that you do further research on those that interest you the most. First we have a Tlinka and Elliot artist who is inspired by his culture's connection to creative making and knowledge. His work looks into resilience and what it means to be connected and disconnected from the land. Next we have a Venezuelan kinetic sculptor and painter. Some of his sculptures are actually interactive as well. Next we have a Paraguayan textile artist. He's embracing his queer identity and aesthetic. He does this by working primarily with embroidery and painting onto household textiles and clothing items. Next is an Onondaga and Nez Perce painter. He conceptually looks at what it means to be a Native American in contemporary times with recognizable imagery like the technology that we see here. Now we have a Muscogee and Cherokee painter who stylistically utilizes both a painterly effect and very strong outlines. Again, she's celebrating her culture and her ancestry. Next we have a Chilean architect, filmmaker, and artist who often uses installation. His works investigate public response to media and the images of horrible, tragic events like genocide and famine. Here we have an Akwazasni Mohawk sculptor and jewelry artist. She integrates her family and their acts of storytelling into her artwork, and in doing so, she's investigating the natural in relation to the human made. And here we see a Mexican architect, sculptor, photographer, and installation artist. Within his work, he makes references to both other artists and other movements like modernism. Colombian painter and sculptor, Working primarily with figures in his own signature style, which is called Boterismo, and it utilizes bulging round forms. Conceptually, his work frequently comments on politics. Next, we have a Mohawk and Blackfoot interdisciplinary artist working in painting, sculpture, video, and performance. Her work analyzes language and conceptually focuses on her heritage, as well as concerns of other indigenous people. Here we see an Afro-Peruvian photographer, poet, and performance artist. Her work is focused on African diaspora in Peru and sharing her own personal experiences. This is a Brazilian architect, sculptor, installation, and a performance artist who often references the human body in their work, combining materials like bones, lead, iron, and glass. And this is a Guatemalan poet, painter, sculptor, and performance artist. Her work is feminist and often utilizes vibrant colors, geometrical forms, and techniques of abstraction. Here we see a Dominican painter, printmaker, sculptor, and installation artist. He's known for working with found objects and addressing concepts like politics, colonialism, racism, and poverty. So what? Why does any of this matter? Well, for starters, indigenous art and history is largely overlooked in education and just general culture. In addition, we often don't think of Central and South America when we say, quote, American art. And as someone living in North America, it's really important to me that I do two things. First, 
I acknowledge the colonialist history of my home. And second, I take a stand to amplify the voices of indigenous people so that the only narrative that they get to tell is not one of colonialism, but one of pride and celebration and reclamation of culture. And beyond that, it means inclusion, active inclusion by sharing their art, by sharing their stories that they tell themselves, not something that we've painted with Eurocentricity. And it means including them and actively listening for the conversation about what it means to be an American. And on that note, I'm going to end this lecture. So as always, stay safe, try to get enough sleep, and I will see you all in class.